Okay, I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School. Today is Monday, January 10, 2022. The time is 6, 6 18 p.m. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Before we get started, I'd like to thank members of the public for attending the school board business meeting to observe the work being done on behalf of all school district stakeholders. We appreciate the time you took to be here this evening. As a reminder, Northfield Public Schools requires all people over the age of two to wear a mask, to wear a face covering while inside a school district facility, including during our school board meetings. So in the table file today, we uh, have uh, just some personnel items, appointments, an increase, decrease, and change of assignments, and one resignation. That's the table file for this evening. Okay. If there are no objections, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Okay. Moved by Jeff, seconded by Amy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We now move on to the public comment portion of our meeting. Is there a public, is there anybody signed up to make public comments? Okay. So, um, nope, if we don't have anybody for public comment, we can move on. All right, we'll move on to announcements and recognition. Okay, Herman? Yes. Give me one moment, there we go. We just have one announcement this evening. Uh, we want to congratulate Zach Edwards and Ella Pribble. These are these students are the Minnesota State High School League Arts, Academics, and Athletics Award winners for Northfield High School. This is commonly referred to as the AAA Award. And this State High School League Award, each school honors high school seniors throughout the state. They've uh, had a 3.0 or higher grade point, point average, and they participated in league-sponsored athletics and fine arts activities. So this is a very prestigious honor. And we want to congratulate Zach Edwards and Ella Pribble for being Northfield High School's uh, 2022 AAA Award honorees. Excellent. Board members, any other announcements? Mm -hmm. Amy? I know this was announced at the last meeting, but I just want to remind everybody that next Monday night, Dr. Hillman is Thanks. receiving the Human Rights Award on um, by the Office of being um, recognizing his contribution to the advancement of human rights in the city of Northfield. And it's decided by the Human Rights Commission and at their Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration, which is going to be by Zoom. So just check the city website and everybody can Zoom in and support Dr. Hillman as he receives his award. Excellent. All right, we will now move on to items for discussion and reports. Tonight, we have the annual report from Prairie Creek Community School presented by Director Simon Taylor, followed by Arcadia Charter School presented by Director Laura Stelter. And Simon is uh, joining us this evening remotely. So Tim's going to uh, cue Simon up. We should see him on the screen here in just a moment. And Simon is going to present remotely tonight. Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and see you well, Simon. All right, let's see if I can let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, we can wonderful. see it before the presentation modes. There you go. Perfect. All right, wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, congratulations to the New board chair, and uh, also I would definitely jump in on all the acknowledgements to Julie. It's been uh, wonderful to uh, partner with her over the last seven years. Uh, congratulations, Julie. Um, yeah, my name is Simon Tyler. I'm the executive director at Prairie Creek Community School since 2011. I really appreciate your time and this opportunity to share a little bit of insight into our um, 2020 2021 school year as part of our annual report. Um, I'm now in my third contractual cycle of leading our school's collaboration with Northfield Public Schools. And uh, it's always a wonderful opportunity to share a little bit about what's going on at Prairie Creek 
and um, hear, hear your questions about our work out in Castle Rock. So uh, I, I have a very brief uh, slideshow for you. Uh, Dr. Hillman very wisely um, limits us to uh, five slides. And in those five slides, I'll really touch on, I think the sort of key pieces of a few things happening around mission, innovation, future plans, um, an overview of our academic progress and, and a look at how we're doing financially and then end with an opportunity to uh, ask any questions that uh, are on, on uh, my mind, uh, your mind, probably not so much my mind. <laughs> In your packet, you did have a one page summary narrative as well as a full annual report so i'll be i'll be touching on a few pieces in that one page summary here okay um let's go to mission innovation and future plans first of all um on the one side of this slide you have the four mission pillars that have been central to prairie creek's work for almost four decades now that we're a community school, child-centered school, progressive education school, and that we work to make the world a better place. Um, one of the key strategic pieces that we were able to follow through on in the 2020-21 school year was to do a really comprehensive review of this mission statement and the vision language that supports it. This is something the board and faculty and community had worked on for a while. And in the spring of 2021, our board did approve a revised May statement. Um, what I would say is that the, the, the key four pillars didn't, didn't change. There was some subtle language change there, a more active uh, verb in that last pillar that we worked to make the world a better place. The focus was really bringing the language up to date and making sure it really on it that we felt to be key vision pieces that we want to sustain them going forward into the next phase of our strategic planning. So we were very proud of this work in the midst of the pandemic to really sort of step back and still say, stay centered on looking at our mission. Um, I think the language in making the world a better place was where we made the most adjustments and revisions. And I'll just read that to you. And of course, this mission statement is in the full annual report and on our website. But that, that last pillar states that we engage in democratic decision-making and problem solving, where children are empowered to speak their voice and affect change in pursuit of a just and compassionate world. We challenge and prepare one another to understand and act to racism and other societal injustices. We nurture a close connection with nature and promote environmental stewardship. So, so with that language, we really wanted it to be a foundation for both where we've been in the past, represent where we've been in the past, um, speak to where we are now, but also present us with opportunity for how we can continue to grow, to innovate, and to improve as we move forward into our next phase of strategic planning. Um, some highlights from the 2020-21 school year. In the first bullet point, I wrote that we had a very resilient community response to the pandemic. Um, as you all understand, it was a very complex um, year that we engaged in for schools uh, the, the last school year. At Prairie Creek, um, we, we did utilize all three of the learning models, hybrid, in-person, and distance learning. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to say how, uh, how proud I am of how the teachers, um, all the staff, uh, our board, and our community responded to really what was one uh, challenge after another that we didn't really have a playbook for, and, and yet wanted to make sure we stayed centered on, on mission um, attended to the wellness of our community and also continued to provide the most dynamic uh, experiential model of learning for children that we could in the circumstances. And I think we've emerged from that with that piece I just mentioned in our mission statement of wanting to be a, com a compassionate community, first and foremost, 
still uh, very much intact. And I'm extremely grateful uh, to everyone in our community uh, for the work they did in really what was a remarkably complex school year. Um, other, if I jump down to the third bullet there, it says outdoor learning. Um, I think we're, we're fortunate at Prairie Creek to have a building and grounds that really does lend itself to this piece of our mission to promote outdoor learning and environmental stewardship. And we, we stayed centered um, on that throughout the pandemic, uh, both, both uh, past and uh, right now by creating spaces outdoors for our children to learn in. This was both a health and safety measure, but also really gave us an opportunity to kind of double down on something we, we believe is just good for kids, uh, being out in nature. And we, we've really taken the opportunity to find a silver lining from things we learned from our time doing this last year that we've now continued into this year. We have a focus on what we call Wild Wednesday at Prairie Creek we utilize the shorter school day, but some um, intentional scheduling around all school gatherings, thematic learning, um, specials and so on, to really have one day in the center of our week where we really put a primary emphasis on getting the kids outside and connecting with nature. Um, the thematic curriculum was something that was definitely challenged last year by the pandemic. Um, multi-age experiential in-person learning where we really engage the parents with what's happening in the building what was, was hard to do. So while we were maintained our multi-age science social studies centered approach to thematic curriculum last year, we've made that an emphasis for our strategic planning in this reset year to now we're back in person, help our families help our children really understand what's happening when they learn about science social studies through an in-depth theme and we, we have a focus this year on communicating with our parents around the purpose behind thematic instruction culminal, culminating events and what we learn about children from that um, teacher-led professional development has been an essential part of our program at prairie creek um, really since its inception. Um, last year, we pivoted very much to make our teacher-led professional development give teachers time to plan together, to manage, to adjust to the different learning models, the changes in curriculum, the learning they needed to undertake very rapidly to lead effective uh, remote learning for students. Um, this year, we've really got a focus on resetting on the why behind our professional um, development model to support mission pieces. Um, primary focus areas this year will be outdoor learning thematic curriculum, but also mental health of um, staff, mental health of students. Um, we're also running several sessions on social emotional learning. Uh, we're finding there's a need to help children re-enter an in-person year and reset on some of our core values around things like oracy and um, essentially just how children are with each other inside our building when they're learning together. Um, a couple of other pieces here I just want to highlight before I move on to the academic piece. Um, we have introduced an ADSIS grant supported program of literacy intervention. Uh, this is new for us this year, so we're betting that in as we return. Uh, it provides a, a tier two model of support for students um, are, who do not qualify for special education, but need some extra um, individual support um, to move towards grade level. And so far that is going very well, supported by um, a new model of three times a year fast bridge assessment as well. And, and finally, I just note that the other real highlight from the last year was concluding the process of self-study and uh, establishing a new five-year contract with our authorizer, um, you know, Phil Public Schools. Um, I think we treasure this relationship, this collaboration, and it was very exciting for me and the school, our board and our community to complete that process and 
to be in this our first year of a new five-year cycle with Northfield. So I'd, I'd like to thank Dr. Hillman and the board for your support with that process. Um, I'll move on a bit and excuse me just a moment, I'm just gonna take a quick uh, drink of water here. Um, there's a lot of, there's a comprehensive overview um, and detail of all the academic data from last year. This slide just gives you a very basic summary based off the um, MCAs, which were um, administered last spring after a, a hiatus due to the pandemic in, in the year prior to that. Um, uh, clearly, as a, a public progressive school, we're very excited about all the progressive education pieces I just talked about in the last slide. But we also want to be very attentive to how we're doing from a accountability perspective. Uh, this slide just gives you the overview that we continue to um, perform above state levels in the areas of uh, science, math, and reading, which are assessed by um, the MCAs at Berry Creek. Um, like everyone else, we're really trying to examine um, what we learned from the spring assessments last year, um, acknowledging that uh, we had a number of children who were in distance learning who did not participate. So our already small cell size data was certainly affected a little bit by this. Um, we're responding to that by introducing um, what we, we hope will be a more diagnostic piece of data using fast bridge assessments for math and reading this year. Uh, this is our first year implementing that assessment and we will tie it into goals that are on our contract with the authorizer and goals we have locally as well. Um, so I, I look forward in, in, in coming reports and years to be able to give you a sense of how that's informing our instruction. Um, assessment at Prairie Creek is, is multifaceted. We, we do think of evaluation in terms of how we know um, the whole child. So we're excited to be back in a, a space this year where we can be looking at children's performance in things like thematic culminating events, um, how they engage in research projects, um, classroom, based formative assessment and reflection pieces. And um, of course, we've continued through the pandemic to follow our model of providing families twice a year with a written narrative about each child. Uh, teachers are currently working on those right now in preparation to share at the mid-year uh, conferences at the end of January. I'll just move on to a few, whoops. So I went a bit far there. Going back to financial management, um, again, a, a key component of our, um, our, our sustainability, our success as a public charter school is careful um, financial management and uh, attentiveness to our, our forward planning in this regard. Um, as, as, as we um, look, look at how we move forward into this next phase of strategic planning, a few things we've been reflecting on as we uh, continue to move through the pandemic is that we, we were able to maintain uh, full enrollment and a consistent wait list uh, through the pandemic. Uh, this is a, a critical piece for, for small schools, for small charter schools that was uh, certainly um, challenged for, for, for some schools um, during the pandemic as families made decisions. Um, we, we did see some reduction in our wait list at kindergarten. And I think this is obviously a piece we're keeping an eye on as we move towards next year and our um, process of en enrollment with families as we go to the next school year. Um, that, that piece of full enrollment enables us to maintain um, steady, predictable funding. Um, the oversight of how we manage our finances at Prairie Creek is done in several spaces. Uh, a key one is a finance committee that meets monthly that has teacher representation on it too. And of course, 
our um, board oversight under the uh, excellent uh, management of our chief financial officer, uh, Keith Johnson. Um, as you'll notice, we've had a strong fund balance um, throughout the past uh, five or six years with a slight um, increase um, during the pandemic due to some funding we received through the um, PPP loan. Um, I, I would note there's a little asterisk there that shows that yeah, that does drop down in FY22, and we have a budget outlook of 39.5%. And as part of our strategic planning, you know, we, we started to think through what staffing have we needed to get us through this pandemic and how do we sustain that strategically within our three to five year um, forecasting. Uh, we have a fund balance policy to remain above 25% that we take very seriously. Uh, having a strong fund balance policy really helped us make decisions in the best interests of families and kids at short notice as we went through the more unpredictable stages, um, early stages of the pandemic. And I, I think it continues to be a very important focus for us to have that resiliency. Um, finally, I'd just like to uh, close with a thank you to uh, Dr. Hillman on your board, I, I think as a community, we, we really noted in the last two years just how critical this relationship is for our school to be in partnership with a local district. N not every charter school, in fact, incredibly few besides ourselves and Arcadia ha have a good fortune to have a local school district as our officer. Uh, we recognize that it's a really intentional decision by the school board to take on that role and forge that collaboration with us. And um, it is something that's greatly appreciated. I'd also like to add in my congratulations to Dr. Hillman on his upcoming Human Rights Award as well, having worked with Dr. Hillman closely for many years now um, and on the Northfield Promise uh, Council of Champions. I've seen firsthand uh, his commitment to equity work in this community. And I think it's a, a very well-deserved recognition. And with that, I'll, I'll pause and um, uh, take any questions you might have. Excellent. Thank you, Director Tyler. Very thorough presentation. Any comments or questions, Amy? Hi, Simon. It's good to see you. Um, hey, good to see you too, Amy. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about how you attract the free and reduced price lunch student population. Do you put out any special um, approaches to try to let more of them know about the school and bring more to the school? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we do a lot of communication around this, both by paper and email at the outset of the school year and through the fall. Um, I think this is a definite area where we've had to sort of keep uh, putting that out to families. Um, I think the lines got a little blurred. Uh, Dr. Hillman can probably explain this far more um, articulately than me, but with the support, we had to give families three um, meals during the pandemic. One of the sort of side issues that developed around that was it took away some of the urgency that I think some of our families um, felt to sign up for free and reduced lunch opportunities. So um, we, we've had our traditional ways of doing it, but I think going forward, um, it's going to be important for us to say to families, uh, continue to say families, you know, this, this is something that we have as a resource. And also, frankly, it's something that, you know, supports the school in, in, in getting funding to uh, provide different services as well. Well, as you know, I've been a supporter of Prairie Creek for many, many years, and um, I just think it would be great if we could find a way of attracting more of the free and reduced price lunch students and so they know about the school and, and are interested in attending. Yeah, yeah thank you, Amy. I, I, I certainly um, concur with that. And I, I think at a board level, we actually had a, a rich conversation about outreach at the last um, meeting, um, utilizing um, tools such as the community ed 
program um, to, to get the word out about our school more systematically as we go forward. And uh, you're certainly not being able to invite families so frequently into our program means that we have to think differently about how we share who we are with a wider community. Any other comments, questions? Good, okay. Oh, I'm Julie. Hi, Tyler, good to see you, or Simon, Simon. Um, yes, yeah. So I apologize. So it's always so wonderful to read your report and your passion for progressive education always comes through loud and clear. And congratulations on um, what I understood is your first phase of the strategic plan and um, refining the um, vision that you had. Um, if I understood you correctly of saying this was the first phase, what is, will the next phase look like? Yeah, Julie, thanks for that question. I, mean, I think I can explain a little more detail. The original intent for us was that this year would be the first year of a three to five year strategic plan. And last year, as we closed out a strategic cycle, was going to be the preparation for that. Um, in conversation with the faculty and the board, in the midst of, midst of which, which was a really rapidly changing year, what we decided to do was to think of this year as its own standalone one year strategic moment. And we developed four essential goals uh, for this year, which were based around the new mission statement, but are really attend, intended to support what we anticipated and indeed is a complex return year. So those pieces centered on, you know, by the first pillar, mental health, by the second pillar, supporting the social emotional learning of students, by the third pillar of progressive education, resetting community understanding of a core piece of progressive education, our thematic approach, and that last piece of centering in on equity um, and beginning conversations around how we embed an equity lens in curricular pieces in our program. And, and we felt that just keeping it defined to those four pieces would be realistic and achievable for us. What we already knew would be a year that would have some challenges. Um, and then the process of developing that longer term strategic cycle begins this spring, in fact, this winter. I will be engaging as a, as a board and faculty and community on a focus on, again, using this new mission statement on what are the longer term goals around each of the four pillars. So, so that work really starts at our next work day in February and with a goal being that we leave this year with a longer term plan that will guide our work going forward. Did, did I answer your question, Julie? Yes, excellent, thank you. And so um, sort of a spoiler alert that will come later, but as part of you acknowledging the, the five-year contract that we were able to put together, of course, we are thrilled that Northfield has been uh, reauthorized as a charter school authorizer. And it was, I would say, a grueling 18 months for Dr. Hillman. The process began in summer of 2020 and the uh, the official notice that we are now uh, reauthorized as a charter school authorizer um, came in December of 2021. So um, we appreciate that Dr. Hillman has has worked as hard and, and Simon, um, you know, you have worked right alongside with developing and forging that strong relationship and really um, from Talking to Dr. Hillman, I understand there's some quarterly review meetings happening, which is really excellent because we do, we can have so much sharing between, um, you know, the the dyslexia program that you helped train our elementary teachers last year is just one example. So those quarterly meetings I know will be um, really uh, great for for sharing of ideas and strengthening um, the relationship um, that we have. So. We appreciate that work, and I, I hope that you know that the board is very supportive of charter schools and, and the choice that it provides for parents in our community. So we appreciate your work. We, we are very grateful for Dr. Hillman and the, and the work he does to forge such a strong relationship with you and then 
um, the work that you do to, to ensure that relationship is, is productive, so. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Julia. That's, that's wonderful news. And I, I know Laura will echo what I have to say on this, uh, um, that the new quarterly check-ins we have with Dr. Hillman uh, are invaluable to us. And in, in fact, at the last one, we did have a conversation around best practices, around strategic planning design. Uh, Dr. Hillman has a wealth of experience and uh, Laura and I uh, really benefit from this relationship. So again, thank you. Dr. Hellman? Yes, and uh, just Simon, as always, a great presentation. Uh, Prairie Creek is a gem that we have within our community. Uh, but as my grandmother would say, uh, Simon Tyler also likes to hide his lights under a bushel basket. And so I'd be remiss if I did not share with the board that something that got by us last spring with all of the things that were going on is that uh, Simon was named the 2021 Minnesota Association of Charter Schools Charter Leadership Award winner. And so that recognizes excellence in leadership of charter schools in the state of Minnesota. Max is of course a large organization of all the charter schools in the state. And this is the most prestigious honor that a charter school leader can win. Um, no shock to any of us who know Simon. My only question is how it, how it had been 30 years and he hadn't gotten the award yet was my question. But Simon, congratulations to you. You are just certainly um, one of the outstanding educational leaders in our community. We're grateful for our relationship. And on behalf of the school district, and your, as your authorizer, we publicly congratulate you on that 2021 Charter Leadership Award. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, very nice. Um, and I just wanted to add to that your reputation of your program um, is just outstanding. When I moved here, people didn't just share about Prairie Creek, they raved about it. So congratulations on that. And I also appreciated hearing about your intervention program for those students who aren't officially qualified for special ed services. Nice job. All right. So we will move on to our next presentation, Arcadia Charter School presented by Director Laura Stelter. Okay, thank you. Speaking of great charter school leaders, here's Laura Stelter. Well, I am surrounded by amazing school leaders who have really mentored me the last couple of years, and I really appreciate all of the support that I get to. Can you make sure that that uh, is turned on? Should it have a red light? It has a red light. Okay, there you go. Now just make sure you pull the okay. microphone a little closer to you. There you go. All right. How's that? Okay. I'll just have it touch the front of the mask. Okay. Um, I was just saying thank you. So I'm really grateful to have Simon and Dr. Hillman on my team uh, as I learn more about school leadership since this is year three for me and I have been doing pandemic leadership the whole time. And so as I'm starting to think about what happens when you lead a school after a pandemic, I really appreciate having such amazing people to work with and the support of Northfield Public Schools and all of you. And so last year, as we were trying to decide what we were going to do, all the different model shifts and all those things, we came back to our mission and vision. And we talked a lot about um, what, you know, what, what's really the core of who we are as a school um, that is a choice in this community. And so we thought about, okay, if we're going to move our students online, then how are we going to have them um, still preparing to transition intellectually, emotionally, and ethically um, to higher education and future employment and engage citizenship. And so we, um, we did move all of our classes online. So students were, even if they were in the building, we did have a hybrid model where students were in the building in cohorts to get extra support, but all of their classes were still online so that teachers didn't have to navigate between two modes of teaching. Um, and it, created some really exciting opportunities. So students were with family more, with siblings more. And so projects started to look different. They might incorporate things that needed to happen at home or incorporate um, their relationship with their parent in a way that it hadn't before, like a woodworking project with a parent or um, students who were starting to think about where, what they wanted to do after school, had conversations with parents that they might not have had because parents were there. 
um, when they were having those conversations with us. And so there were some really cool opportunities that came out of having students at home doing project-based learning. So it, the nice thing about project-based learning is it's really flexible and very adaptable and um, very differentiable. So we had students doing a wide range of things um, that really, I think, met with our goals, um, despite the fact that we were having to do it in a really unusual way for us as having been a pretty hands-on school. Um, so there was also research that came out in 2021 that supported project-based learning. And so we've been reading more about that and talking more about how that will influence us going forward. Um, in August, we actually, the whole staff did a PDL 101 training to sort of recenter project-based learning as part of what we do. Um, and that came out of last year's experience as well. Um, my presentation is shorter than Simon's. If you, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm not going into quite as much detail. Um, MCA data. So we had um, in science and reading, we were well above the state averages. In math, we were quite a bit below. But when I looked at the data, only 24 students, we, we were in a hybrid model at this point and only 40% of Arcadia students were in the building. And so of the 24 students who tested in math, 11 were sixth graders who had just come from an interrupted fifth grade year. And so we're behind in math. And so I believe that this is most likely pandemic related, but we have responded to that by um, we hired a math tutor, an additional math tutor. We have uh, our math teacher working closely with students to try and help them make up some of that uh, loss. And then we're also, this year, we started the year out. Uh, we did map testing across the school so that we'll have some data so that we can look at growth um, as we move forward with math. But in reading, um, that same group of 11 students were 90% proficient in reading. And so we looked at what we had done with reading, which included uh, sustained silent reading and daily basis and some of um, supportive literacy practices. And so um, we're really focused now on that math piece, but we were really pleased to see that our science and reading scores are very strong. And um, that's common, but actually these are even higher than previously, so. And then in terms of financial management, so last year we spent less money. We had, uh, so typically Arcadia has had eight advisors. Um, last year we went down to six advisors. Uh, we had a very small senior class. One of the things that's a challenge for high school advisors is working with senior projects because these are usually pretty substantial projects involving mentors and scheduling and a, a substantial process. And um, last year we only had eight seniors. And so we didn't really need um, eight advisors. So um, at the middle school level, we've typically had four, but really in terms of the number of students in the middle school, 45 to 54, um, three is a more appropriate number. So with that staffing change, that's part of the reason that we spent less last year. Um, part of it was operations, the business of the school. I mean, it was closed for a number of months, and so we spent less money there. Uh, and then we also did, in the second round, go after a PPP loan, which was really helpful to us and is going to help us this year, um, now that staffing levels are higher again, um, to support some of those, like the math tutor. And um, we added some time. Uh, we added a college career uh, counselor. So, but our fund balance did go from around 13% up to 28.88%. And then that's, we anticipate that that will go down to about 24%. Um, but our, it's substantially higher than our actual policy, which is to have $400,000. Um, it is over $500,000 right now. And last part of my spiel for you. Um, in the pictures here, just a response to some of last year's challenges. We did see mental health really significantly impacted for students last year. 
And so this year we started out with a nine day expeditionary learning module. And so for the first nine days, it was a civics focused um, and experiential uh, learning time. So all of the teachers had small groups. We did a lot of, um, basically we took our social contract process, which is an important part of our annual work every year. And instead of doing it in the first couple of days, we did it in the first couple of weeks with all of the students involved in various ways, learning about civics content. So um, the picture on the left, we had alums and our first director, Tim Goodwin, um, come and speak to students about the history of the school and what the social contract process means and why that's such a significant part of what it means to be an Arcadian. And then the picture in the right, they were doing a gratitude web activity uh, where they were talking to each other about what they had learned from each other um, over the course of their time together as a group. So, Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. Are there any comments or questions from the board members? Amy? I think I asked, well, thank you first, Laura, for presenting to us. It's always good to hear an update on Arcadia. Um, my question this year, I think I asked last year as well, <laughs> which is, I know you have a higher percentage of special ed students, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you have any sense that they were um, affected differently or more so or less so by COVID or in the whole pandemic process, just if there, if you want to report anything about that. Sure. Um, we did bring students in. Um, so even when we were in distance learning, we did have some students who qualified for special education services who were in the building um, to try and continue to support students who wouldn't have been as successful at distance learning. So we really didn't have um, probably a substantial um, learning loss for a lot of those students. Um, we worked really hard to try and make sure that we were still supporting them in whatever ways they needed. So my sense is that we, we really were pretty successful with distance learning and in meeting students' needs, um, which I, being a small school, it made it really quite a bit easier for us. Um, as, and we were a small school with a number of outside doors. So we could actually open doors and have students in rooms. And so we found lots of creative ways to make sure people were engaged. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention, but our attendance actually was higher last year on a daily basis than in previous years. It was at 95% on a daily, like for the year. Um, so I know a lot of schools had trouble with students just not showing up. That was not the case for us. We mm. really had people there every day. And so. Was your hybrid based on two different cohorts or did you let students come who wanted to come? Was it more of a volunteer hybrid? A volunteer. So anybody who wanted to come could come um, and we would place them in a cohort. And so only about 40% of students wanted to come. Um, and then we used all of the classrooms and had them we taped out six foot boxes and everybody had their little space. And um, that was really the, the benefit of it just the number of people who chose to do it and the number of outside doors we had and the number of classrooms worked out really well. And so um, it was anybody who wanted to could come. And we did end, we had May term, which is a part of our program every year. We still ended with May term. We called it in person. So anybody could choose to come to May term. A lot of them were outdoors. We had gardening and recreation and outdoor things, but um, we still offered some online options because there were people who really did not set foot in the building all of last year, um, but they still came to school every day. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, Julie? Laura, it it is really good to see you. I know last year it was via via Zoom, mm -hmm. so it's wonderful to have you here. And thank you for the work you're doing and the way you have, uh, I think um, Simon said, resiliently uh, been able to to um, um, work through the challenges of the pandemic. So, and it was really fun to hear the stories behind those photos. And I I noticed because I believe last year you talked about the wonderful addition to the sign that was developed. 
yeah. created by a student. So that that's really fun. Um, one thing you talked about last year and, and not sure, of course, with all the challenges and, and the immediate needs of the pandemic, you talked about trying to introduce some restorative justice practices. Were you able to do any work um, on that on that goal this past year? I can say that the way that I'm currently dealing with discipline looks very different than I think people are used to. <laughs> um, we actually just recently had an incident where I had a number of people who were surprised that I didn't suspend the child, but it wasn't really that wouldn't have fixed anything. It wouldn't have helped anything. And the goal is to restore this child to our community, right? So um, I think that it's, I'm doing that work at my level and I have a brand new social worker who is going to do some training around it. And I have um, a teacher who's done restorative circle training um, who has led some circles. And so that is, um, certainly a strong influence in the direction that we're heading right now. Excellent, thank you. And of course, thank you for the, the great working relationship you also have with Dr. Hillman. Um, you and, and Simon just really work so well and we appreciate the work that, that you have done to forge that relationship with the district. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hillman. I just wanna uh, point out to the board, the recentering on project-based learning. So I know Laura made a focal point of that, but I think it's important to come back to that because one of the things that we're so grateful to have Arcadia within our community is that ability to commit to project-based learning in a way that many traditional schools cannot. It goes back to the very foundational story of Arcadia. And frankly, it goes back to the foundational story of charter schools in Minnesota. When the charter law was first developed, its intent was really to be almost a laboratory for charter schools to try new and innovative ideas free from some of the regulations that the state has on traditional public schools. And so over the years with the rise of the basic skills test and the rise of the MCA, so many charter schools got away from some of that original mission out of necessity, right? It was out of, because they are still public schools, they still have to qual uh, uh, go with all of those state required assessments. So I, I think this recentering on project-based learning is just a really important piece for not only for Arcadia, but for our entire community, because when Arcadia does this well, they teach us and can help us with that. And that's the reciprocal relationship that we have. So I just, I want that to be the main takeaway tonight is that recentering on project-based learning. It is the heart of what Arcadia has always done and bringing it back to the top, I think is outstanding. So well done. Thank you. Any other comments? And I was going to comment too on um, how impressive that that uh, project was on civic learning. Yeah. So timely. Um, I was I just heard a story about a program that uh, Sandra Day O'Connor has developed on civics, and so it was just very impressive to hear about it here in Northfield. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, we're going to move on next. Um, we have policy 460. I believe it's the first read. Dr. Hillman, will you be presenting? Yes, I will. So uh, what you have in front of you this evening as we continue to bring uh, policy both for review and for new policies. Uh, this evening you have a uh, the first reading of what would be a new policy on remote work. Uh, so over the last two years, we clearly have seen uh, how uh, remote learning and remote work can play into a traditional public school um, situation or uh, operations. And uh, especially since we've been back in person full time in the fall, we have looked at saying, we just, we needed to look at saying, we know that we can do some remote work. Now there are certain positions within the school district that do have the ability to work remotely, not all the time. Sometimes I suppose it could be all the time, but in many cases it could be for, for short bursts of time or for specific reasons. So Director of Human Resources, Molly, Weiselman uh, did quite a bit of research on this policy. We, there are not a ton of public schools in the state yet that have a remote work policy. Um, but when we are looking at supporting people to work remotely at certain points, we need to have a set of guidelines and rules for that. And we do that in the district through policy and procedure. So as you'll see in the policy, there's this is again, as uh, uh, Claudia said, this is first reading. But the key thing is to make sure that you look that this is not something that everybody could do. There's some specific positions there are specific approvals, there are agreements that would have to be made, but we know that um, 
especially for some positions in the district, when we are competing with other kinds of organizations, remote work is becoming something that is a competitive point. And so as we look for, say, for example, some district office level positions, the possibility of some more regular remote work is something that we need to consider and have a set of rules to govern. So that's what this policy is this evening. It's the first read. I'd be happy to take any questions on it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Tom. How long is the um, trial period uh, performance during the trial period? Uh, yeah, so Tom, I think that the trial period has not been specifically defined because that will be defined depending on the person uh, or the position and the department. Not every department is created equal in terms of this how this would go. So it's not been defined specifically. And the trial period is something that can be an agreement between the supervisor and the employee who's gonna work remotely. So it could be, let's try this for two weeks. In another case, it might be for a month. So we wanna be able to be nimble and uh, be able to adjust that trial period based on the circumstances. Okay, good and were there, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, were there a lot of requests from employees to do this or is it? I, I wouldn't characterize it as a lot. Uh, we have had some requests and we are also, I mean, there are some examples I will share. So for example, if you have someone who needs to be out for a period of time, um, but they could conduct their work remotely, if we can support and work with them on that, and because and, it's some quite a few positions in our district, we can't have someone come in and take over for a period of time. In our classrooms, we have substitute teachers. Things We don't have a substitute payroll person, for example, or some people in our finance department, or some of the folks who run some of our HR systems. So if there was a, for whatever reason, they needed to be out for a period of time, uh, an ill spouse or an ill parent, and they were able to accomplish of their tasks remotely, we want to be prepared for it. We've had some circumstances already where we have authorized it. Um, we, this is really a beyond the pandemic remote work piece. Of course, there's parts in the pandemic right now that where we're still seeing some requests for that. It isn't nearly what it was a year ago, but we know that this is even beyond the pandemic. And so um, I wouldn't characterize it as a lot, but we have had some requests, some of which we've been able to work through individually um, and some of which we just have not been able to accommodate either. So that's, we, we'd like to have a, a go-to guide to say, this is how we make those decisions. And, and I've noticed that um, other employers are also offering things like this for the same reason. Um, uh, one, we learned that you can work at home and two, because of uh, extenuating circumstances that it helps. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, Noel. Dr. Hillman, where is the liability issue on this? So Noel, are you talking about liability for things that happen at home, for example? Yes. Yeah, so I think that, that one of the reasons that uh, you'll see that as part of the remote work policy, there's a set of procedures uh, that walks and talks through the home office setting. So uh, this position would be governed, these, or these remote work positions um, ad hoc as needed would be governed on our, under our general uh, insurance policy. But you'll also see that there are some validations about making sure they have, we're gonna actually inspect the space for ergonomic uh, effectiveness. We're gonna make sure that we know what equipment is being provided. There are some very clear pieces about what equipment can be used and what equipment can't be used. And so it would be covered in general under our general liability uh, but there's also a number of different pieces to even get to the point of where you're allowed to work remotely with an inspection of the space, et cetera. Good question. Julie? Um, I, re I think this policy is a really great idea. And, and I really like that, um, you know, Molly has done the research around how we put, we, put this, we put this together. And I appreciate you clarifying, that was my question when they talked about safety of the workspace, security, et cetera, how that actually can be enforced. And it seems like there'll be some sort of site checks done there. Um, my other question, so this is outside of, I believe in the recent NEA contract where we have some opportunity for staff on certain staff development days that they can do that. They don't have to be on site to do that work, but that isn't really what this policy is addressing, correct? That is correct. What uh, Julia is referring to in the, in the uh, most recently approved NEA agreement, days that are officially teacher work days. So those teacher work days as outlined by the master agreement 
uh, administration is not allowed to call meetings or things like that. So in the language, we did put that on those specific days, uh, positions covered under the NDA contract can complete their work remotely if they so choose. That is separate from what this policy governs. Great question. So that is covered then from, from how I read it in item for eligibility, because it does take out, it talks about positions that are not eligible for remote work and it lists them. Is that what that's referring to? Right, and I would okay. also say that in this case, that particular ability is governed by the contract first. Okay, yep, makes sense, thank you. Any any other comments or questions? I had one question about: um, Is there going to be an expense in purchasing additional computers or furniture for some of these um, employees? That's a great question. Uh, so almost almost all of our staff, probably by the end of next month, will have as their main computer a laptop computer. So. Um, you know, teachers for some time now have had a laptop computer as their main computer, and we have been continuing to transition our office staff to laptops that plug into a docking station, right? So this way, um, for a person who is going to go to remote work, they would be able to bring their laptop with them if that was the case. So will there be some expenses? There will be some, ex there could be some expenses. We've done work in the policy to limit those to allow what we are already using to be the main driver of that. And the most expensive piece is the technology. Mm -hmm. And we already are uh, updating the technology in that way for, I, I'm fairly certain it's for all employees who would be uh, eligible under this agreement. And you mentioned there'd under be- this policy, okay. excuse me. You mentioned there'd be an inspection to see if their stations were ergonomic. Who would be carrying those out? So uh, typically uh, when we do ergonomic pieces, uh, it is actually in the past, our school nurse has done that, but it would be in conjunction with our HR department. Okay, interesting. Val's gonna point something out. She's been helpful in this policy as well. Um, we do actually have um, a service through our work comp provider. Right. Um, they do ergonomic analysis for free as part of our policy as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was first read. And we'll move on now to um, Superintendent Hillman presenting operations in COVID-19 update. Yes, I'm going to uh, start with some other items specific uh, to non-COVID related items, and then we'll get into the COVID component. So I wanted to, so I'm gonna start backwards from the end of the report. And I just wanna remind at the last board meeting, I talked with the board about uh, the analysis that we're beginning to conduct of the Northfield High School facility. I gave you kind of a, just a heads up at that point. And I want to just go into a little bit more detail at this point. So uh, we have been partnering with Wold Architects and Engineers, as well as Knutson Construction. These are the firms who we worked with on our elementary school uh, bond campaign projects. Uh, and so we have been working with them. Uh, they, uh, Wold actually has come in and is working on an analysis of all of the different uh, building systems and spaces. So they've actually been in every single room at the high school. They are analyzing the HVAC systems, the electrical, all of the kinds of things that you would think you're going to evaluate in the, in the infrastructure um, of a building. And we are now starting to move out to, I just don't want the board to be surprised. We're gonna to begin to recruit uh, some broader groups of stakeholders to give feedback about the current high school as it relates to two items. First of all, the building infrastructure. So the things like lights, heating, temperature, all of those kinds of things that about the comfort and the efficiency of the building, uh, as well as the educational adequacy of the facility. So what I just really want to share is that we're going to start those pieces that I'll keep the board uh, informed of it as we go along. But I just want to make sure that you're aware that we're getting into some deeper discussions uh, with, um, with staff and with students and with families in the community about that particular space. I do wanna share with the board that right now, what the focus is on as we're having those discussions is really around uh, renovation and or addition of the uh, current site. So I'm not saying that that's where it would end up. I'm just saying that's where, our, where we are focusing our energy on. Uh, I also do wanna, it's gonna be talking about all of the kinds of things in terms of um, athletic space, art spaces, all, all of those kinds of things that we know we have heard from stakeholders over the last several years. And I also want to be really straight up with the board too, that 
we do need to understand uh, that we have a potential, there, there is some potential for a bond referendum in the near future that would limit new tax impact for property taxpayers because we do have previous bonds uh, from the middle school, from Bridgewater, those projects from about 20 years ago or so that are gonna be retired in 2024 and 2025. And so I just, we, the, the district always takes the financial ramifications into consideration. And we are considering those facts that we will have bond debt that is coming off in 2024 and 25 that would limit the new tax impact or additional tax impact is the way I should say it for property taxpayers. So I just wanna be clear that we are starting to talk about this. We are focusing on renovation, addition, those kinds of things, and then getting feedback from, gonna start getting feedback this spring from stakeholders. So I just wanna share that part. Um, wanna share a very exciting uh, component in terms of our elementary reading instruction. As you well know, that is a uh, focus that we have had for several years. Three years ago, we adopted uh, the really high quality Center for Collaborative Classroom Literacy Curriculum. As you know, in that first pre-pandemic year, we saw some pretty significant increase in our third grade reading scores and reading scores more across the board, but especially in that uh, really important benchmark of grade three. And as we've continued to work on ensuring that we are using the science of reading, we've learned so much about how the brain can learn to read. And we're leveraging that research. And uh, of course, Director of uh, Instructional Services, Hope Langston is always on the lookout for how can we improve our pedagogy, not just the material, but how the actual mechanisms and the methodology that we use to teach reading. And so the legislature in its last session provided some funding for training for something that's called the Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. We have now we have an update that we have at least 16 teachers who have been accepted for the training uh, for what they call letters training. The legislature, the Department of Ed through the legislative funding is funding the training. It's about $4,000 a piece. So this is a pretty substantial uh, funding mechanism from the state of Minnesota. It is not a joke. It's about 140 hours of really intense training. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that schools can try to provide that training for their staff. We do not have the capacity to give people substitutes. We, there's a number of things we don't have the capacity to do. So we are looking to um, be able to pay those teachers a stipend to be able to complete the training outside of the regular contract day. And again, this is, I'm, this is my first time reporting to you that this training aligns with our new strategic plan, specifically our strategic commitment of learner outcomes and that benchmark that we focused on making sure that students are reading at grade level. And so, of course, that's something we've always talked about. We've been strong partners with the community for that. Uh, but this letters training is just the next step in ensuring that our staff have the materials and the training to effectively teach reading to students who come at this skill from a variety of different perspectives and a variety of different backgrounds and a, a variety of different entry level skills. So um, I just really want to thank Hope Langston and the Instructional Services Department. One of our instructional services uh, coaches, uh, Alicia Clary, is actually already participating in it. We sent her to the training first to see, hey, how does this training uh, work with the, the way that we're looking at this? And she is reporting it's just outstanding. Several other states, including Mississippi and Rhode Island, have used this at their state level and seen dramatic gains in proficiency. So this is a research-based uh, system that we know has experience working elsewhere. So we're really proud to share that with you that we are continuing to move that part forward. As uh, has been stated before, a bright spot that I wanna share with you today is that we have been renewed for the next five years as a charter school authorizer in Minnesota. I wanna remind people that we are one of only two traditional public school districts in the state that go through the rigorous process to be uh, certified or to be uh, certified to be a charter school authorizer. So we did recently complete um, the, the application for renewal was due right at the beginning of 2020. And, and I'm not kidding, it was in August of 2020. You might remember what we were doing in August of 2020, trying to plan for multiple learning models, all those kinds of things. So we fully expected uh, to need to go into what they call corrective action. Uh, so where you are assessed by a third party uh, organization. Uh, we, were, we were identified for corrective action, which was no shock. In fact, many even single purpose authorizers end up in corrective action after the first application. And I just really wanna thank uh, the Minnesota Department of Education Charter School Department, um, specifically Karen Calterterra, uh, who is our contact. 
incredibly patient, incredibly supportive, very helpful in making sure that we were able to do what we needed to do to complete the corrective action plan and be renewed as an authorizer for the next five years. Uh, this is something that, uh, as Julie uh, alluded to earlier, is some work, right? There's some work to get renewed. But every time I go to Prairie Creek or go to Arcadia, it is always worth it because having that strong sense of public school choice within our community is in Northfield's DNA. And so it is something that we are committed to. And so I just, I'm proud to share with the board that we have been renewed as an authorizer and we have another five years um, before we have to renew again. So I'm gonna stop there uh, prior to talking about uh, the pandemic related items on the list and ask if there are any questions or comments about what I've shared so far in the report. Amy? So with the letters program? Yes. Who pays the stipend to the teachers for the extra hours that they put in? The school district, we do. So we'll cover that. And yes. then they, so the state covers the cost of the program. Itself. Correct. Okay. And we are also, my understanding is that HCI may also provide some financial support for some of the things that go a lot, not necessarily the stipends, but some other pieces to help uh, with that training. Okay. Any other questions? No? Dr. Hillman, I'm curious to know if we're the only one of two public schools that are authorizers, can you give me an example of some of the other authorizers? Absolutely. So there's a, really a couple of kinds of authorizers within the state of Minnesota. The charter law goes back 30 years, a little more than 30 years. Uh, Minnesota, of course, we have to highlight was the first uh, state in the nation to have a law governing charter schools to allow this really more innovative approach, um, releasing these charter schools from some of the traditional rules that uh, traditional public schools are bound by. So uh, it's us and it is Chisago Lakes who are the two traditional public school districts who remain. And the rest are what are called single purpose authorizers. This ranges in a whole different, uh, uh, all sorts of different ways. So it would range from other small authorizers like uh, the University of St. Thomas, who has actually already said they are going to stop being a charter school authorizer in a couple of years. There's also the uh, Audubon Society of the North Woods is one of the large authorizers, a group called Pillsbury United Communities. So these are some, many of them are organizations that are specifically focused on either a geographic area or a specific kind of charter school. There's a number of Friends of Education. Um, there's a number of different uh, charter school authors. I'm trying to think there's maybe a dozen or 15 total in the state, something around that. Uh, so most of them are, the vast majority are what are called single purpose authorizers, which means all that organization does is authorize charter schools. And they may have as few as a few charter schools in their portfolio like us. Um, and then they may have a dozen or 15 in their portfolio, depending on the size. Julie? I just wanted to comment about um, the the work with the high school um, and, and looking at some options there. And I so appreciate that we're engaging Walden Knutson. And we know the incredible job they did for um, our other uh, bond referendum pro, um, projects and just the understanding they have of our school district. And when you look at the work that they did on the old district office space is incredible. And the way they came in and, and figured out how to, how to really maximize that space. So I think it's, it's really exciting. And I know that one thing they do extremely well is engaging in the you know, district, um, you know, the stakeholder input meetings and how well they are able to take all of the comments that people want and really putting it into something that everyone says, yeah, that's what I meant. So. Um, I know there's a long way to go here, but I, I'm just really happy that this project is, uh, that this initiative is starting and that we're really looking at earn, in earnest as to how we could move forward doing some different things at the high school. So That's thank you exciting. for that. And it's fun to hear about things moving forward that aren't just all things COVID, that there's, there's really powerful and good things happening. We like that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. More than we could ever tell you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I'm going to move. Jeff? Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, you know, I've been around a while and actually going back on the charter schools, I mean, it was like, you know, pulling teeth to get a charter. I mean, it, to me, it seems just kind of strange. And I know that 
you know, and back with your, your predecessor, is, is this process gotten any easier with the state to, to get that through or has they made it more streamlined or just you know, that question? Yeah, so I would say that uh, since Northfield Public Schools became back when they called it a charter school sponsor, uh, I would say that the process has gotten more challenging and that is really as a result of legislation. So I think uh, I, I would say in the last maybe 10 or 11 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago in that time frame, uh, there was a review of the charter school landscape in Minnesota. And I, I think that it had grown so quickly that there probably throughout the state, there had not been uh, the kind of oversight, systematic oversight that is really required to ensure quality schools. So I think there were some issues with some schools that prompted the legislature to tighten the rules on authorization and to make sure that there was a rigorous process that you had the capacity to be able to have the oversight to actually make sure that your schools were successful in fulfilling what their charter contracts said. So Jeff, it is more difficult now than when we first started. What I'll tell you is we are now through the second time of this new, what they call MAPES. Uh, it's called MAPES and the acronym stands for the Minnesota uh, Authorizer Performance Evaluation System. Uh, I will tell you that it's one of those things where, you know, we are, our mission uh, related to charter school authorization is to authorize school districts that want to phys or excuse me, charter schools that want to physically plant in the Northfield School District. So we have this very narrow scope. Um, so we go through the rigorous process and, and it's not that we wouldn't accept additional charter schools, it's that we just have this very narrow focus. So we, are, we, we get the benefit of having to do that same rigorous process as everyone else. Uh, um, and actually, I think at, now that we've been through it twice, we know what they're looking for the next time around. We know what we need to do. We're actually setting up a record keeping system to be able to have the documents to present to them when it comes time for renewal. So as long as the legislature leaves it as it is, we think we're in fairly good shape moving forward. And in fact, uh, I'm considering uh, putting in a proposal to uh, present um, at our superintendents association about the benefits of being a charter school authorizer as a school that I think more school districts would actually benefit from being charter school authorizers. And so we're gonna, we're go that's a way we can help try to replicate successful charters. And so that's something that we're looking at, whether it's this year or next year, we're gonna look to present um, with our friends from our two charter schools about how, how this really, the district charter relation, which in so many communities is at loggerheads, that it doesn't have to be, and it can be a mutually beneficial arrangement. Good question. Any other questions, comments on this part of the presentation? I, I have a couple. Yes. Um, how did the teachers qualify? You said they qualified, several qualified. What did they have to do to qualify? So they, uh, for the letters training? For the letters yeah. training. So they had to complete an application with the state. In fact, we weren't, it's an unusual situation mm. because the state decides whether individual teachers are in or out. This particular legislation intended to remove school districts as the intermediary because they wanted to offer this to teachers who wanted to get the training. Mm. We coordinated the applications within our system. And so people applied to the state. We actually did have some people who didn't necessarily, didn't get in right away. We advocated, they really wanted to be part of it. And so um, th they had to make the application directly to the state. I don't know how the state made the selection. In fact, we, I'll just say, I don't know how we, how the state made the selection, but we're very thankful that we have 16 people who we understand have been accepted for the letters training paid for by the state. Wonderful. It, are you noticing that it's newer teacher, seasoned teacher, seasoned teachers? When I took this training as a second grade teacher, um, I benefited because I was a new teacher. It was like this program, the way that that we had it in our, you know, my previous community, it was almost like taking your wisest, most experienced phonics instructor and putting that into a program. So we all benefited. It is a range. So it ranges from people who are in their first year of teaching mm. to people who are not only seasoned literacy teachers, right? Seasoned, but they are also the literacy leads at our buildings. These are, we also have people who are already licensed as K-12 reading specialists in the state, which is a separate licensure you can get. Mm -hmm. We have several people who are also re licensed K-12 as a reading specialist who have also applied. So in our district, it ranges because we're really focusing on making sure that we build this infrastructure that you have someone with the training not too far from your classroom. And then 
of course, we always like to try to get to a train the trainer model when we can. But in the end, the state decided who was getting in the, the end, program. the state decided, yes, but it's a variety of people within our system right now. And I have one question on the high school yes. piece. Um, what is your plan for collecting and sharing the feedback that you get? I'm looking to hear that there's going to be something kind of formal as opposed to we have heard something. I, I, I don't know. What, yep. How are you going to share it? So uh, we will give you, provide you reports uh, mm -hmm. as those stakeholder groups. One of the great things about working with WOLD is that they are incredibly detailed about the meeting minutes and notes. Mm -hmm. So at every one of these stakeholder meetings, they will take and, and they will actually share the minutes with Anita and I, or whomever else, Cole or, or Val, whoever's at the table, to make sure that what was, and in fact, they will actually send those minutes to everybody who was on the stakeholder committee and make sure that they captured you know, what was said. So as we give you updates about the process, we'll be able to provide that kind of detail for you. Excellent. All right, you wanna pr proceed with the rest of the presentation? Sure, so uh, the regular updates, let's start, uh, go back to the top and uh, we will show you the, the chart that you have seen fairly regularly. Um, I wish that it was good news. It is uh, not good news in terms of the count of the cases. You take a look at the chart. We had really had a four week, week over week reduction in the total number of cases at the county. When I've been sharing with you now over the past several meetings that county case rate per 100,000 residents over a seven day period, um, in December, early, late November, early December, when I shared with you initially the potential exit strategy, we were above 500 per 100,000. And just within a few weeks, we had gotten down toward the end of the year, we were down to just over 200, about 220 per 100,000. And then uh, we have seen Omicron uh, hit here as they have predicted. We were not shocked. Uh, at all by the increase of cases, though I will tell you as the person who updates the dashboard every morning, it is a little surreal uh, to see the numbers go up uh, as they have even within our school district. Uh, Rice County updated theirs today, uh, their county case rate today. And what we see is that it is it is clearly here and the current rate is 742.1 per 100,000 residents. And that's for the period of January 2nd through January 8th. So it is not shocking to anyone that those cases have increased. This is what has been predicted. It is what we have seen in every other place where an Omicron surge has happened. You see this really uh, significant steep climb in cases. We are hopeful that we will see the commensurate uh, decline in cases going down as quickly as they came up as some of other places throughout the world after their Omicron wave have seen. But right now uh, in the county, we are seeing some of the highest rates that we've seen in some time. Of course, not topping out in November of 2021 quite yet, um, but we are seeing that we are certainly in the top six or seven in terms of the, the number of weeks uh, where this, this county rate is at. Um, so we are in a situation where we are seeing cases climb. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, checked the COVID-19 dashboard. So just an update, what's in the report was last Thursday. Uh, so as of last Thursday, as you've seen in the report, uh, we were at a total of 135 new cases in the last 14 days, and that had been a total of 445 positive cases since we started keeping track on August 31st. That was through January 6th. This morning, January 10th, this is just a few days later, unfortunately, uh, our current 14-day uh, is 179 cases reported to us in the last 14 days and 508 uh, for the school year going back to August 31st. Now, the good news is that we have so many more tools to work with uh, to try to mitigate the pandemic versus what we had a year ago, right? We have vaccinations, we have um, all sorts of, we have uh, uh, testing is, is much more robust. We have all sorts of tools that we are able to use to try to help combat this. It is still just something that uh, we are in a, in a tough spot. We have been able to handle it so far um, the good news is I just really want to compliment our community. So, we, you know, we did, we do have a, a strong inventory of rapid COVID-19 tests now. Just before winter break, we got a shipment of something that's called the BD Verator test uh, that comes in. It's a nasal uh, rapid antigen test that has an accompanying uh, smartphone application. And we put out the note to families that we had those available for free in the district office for four days over winter break. 1,800 of them we distributed. 
And then what we also know is we saw our influenza-like illness rate uh, pretty high last week at a couple of buildings. But again, the silver lining is that even though that rate was high, many of the students who are on that ILI, we call it the ILI roster, had not returned back to school yet after winter break because families had, have heard us, they've listened, they've kept the student home if they were not feeling, if they were not feeling well, and they use those BD Veritor tests to test before they came back to school. So our circumstances, while the data, of course, is showing an increase, I think the responsibility of our families in terms of testing and keeping kids home when they're not feeling well is, is really put us in, a, in a, as good of a position as you can be. We will not lie at all that we are struggling with staffing like everybody else. Uh, we did have 12 and a half unfilled teacher absences today. Um, so what happens in those cases, we start to reassign people within the building. So I, it could be a, a teacher who might typically uh, teach a small group of students some specific reading skills. We're reassigning those folks to take a full general education class for the day. We now have district office staff who are licensed, who are also filling in. So Director of Instructional Services, Hope Langston, taught fifth grade at Bridgewater today. So we are using all of the resources that we have to be able to try to maintain and focus on that commitment that we have to the community of uninterrupted in-person learning. And we're gonna do what we can to keep that going. So what we are hopeful is with, the other thing that I think is helpful is just, these are some anecdotal reports uh, talking with Principal Sam Richardson today from Greenville Park Elementary. He has seen a tipping point where when they do have a, a case, when we do the contact tracing, he's starting to see a shift to where more and more students have either been vaccinated or they have had COVID in the last 90 days. So there are less people that would have needed to quarantine. So those are things that that's part of the evolution. And that we have to be honest that we're transitioning from treating this as a pandemic to treating this as an endemic illness that is going to be with us for some time. So these are the, these anecdotal pieces are things that I'm just sharing about what's happening on the ground in, in each of our schools. Going on to the, the next part is I do want to share that uh, we are we did see, as I mentioned, we did see some ILI rates that were pretty high last week. We have hit over that 5% threshold. We did coordinate with Rice County Public Health because, to go beyond the data, as I mentioned, about many of those students hadn't been there yet, but we still get that level of detail uh, in all of our data analysis. That's an important component for uh, the board and the community to understand. As you know, we have if not all, nearly all of the uh, mitigation strategies recommended by the Minnesota Department of Health. One thing we've heard recently is if people are able to update uh, or upgrade their masks even further. Uh, so we did purchase uh, 37,000 KN95 masks to be able to share with students and staff for those people who would like an upgraded mask over the next several weeks. Again, it's a five layer mask. It offers some better protection. It is not an N95 and N95 is something different, but this is something that is a little bit less than an N95, but a, better than obviously um, uh, the masks that would be slightly less uh, effective as than these would be. So again, offering these pieces to people so that we know Omicron is just a different illness. All It's a different virus almost altogether in some ways. So that is another layer that we're offering. Those Most of those uh, masks came in today. We have the youth, some of the youth versions coming in tomorrow. I wanna to talk briefly just a little bit about testing and the test to stay program. I already mentioned the 1800 BD Veritor tests. We also did just last week, finally get our shipment of Binax Now rapid antigen test that's gonna be used to get the test to stay program started this week. So again, in the test to stay program, this is how the test to stay program would work. I was identified as a close contact with someone at school school who tested positive for COVID-19. And being in close contact means I was within six feet of someone at school who tested positive for COVID-19. And I was within six feet of them for 15 or more minutes. And I was unmasked during that fifth for at least 15 minutes. That's our definition of a close contact. Let's say that we've identified that the first question we ask the student who could be a close contact is, are you vaccinated? If the student is vaccinated, then they do not need to quarantine. They keep coming to school as regular. If they are not vaccinated, the second question that we would ask is, have you, have, have you reported a positive COVID-19 test result to the school district in the last 90 days? If the answer to that is yes, there's that 90 days of infection-based immunity that MDH and the CDC recognize, they can keep coming to school uninterrupted. If the answer to both of those is no, then families have the option for, will have the option later this week to start what we call test to stay. So I would 
get a box of the Binax Now tests that has two tests in it. On the second day of what would have been my quarantine, I test before I come to school. If it's negative, I just keep coming to school. I, I, I come to school on day one. Before I come to school on day two, I take the rapid antigen test. If I'm negative, I can come to school. If not, then I go into the COVID-19 protocol. Then on day five, I test. And so I keep coming to school and then I test again on day five. And if I test negative on day five, I can keep coming. And of course, I just as, this is of course, if you don't have any symptoms, um, we have a system that we've been working on to, for people to basically upload a photo of the test result with their student's name and the date written on it. Um, we've worked with each individual building as to who will validate those tests. This ranges, um, it can range where one building says they uh, uh, have less than five students who, would, who are currently in quarantine that would qualify for this, up to another building that tells me they probably have about 25 students who would qualify for this. So that's the range that we have. Um, I will be straightforward with you. It, it, it could be a little clunky to get started because we're starting this in conjunction with some changes to the quarantine period that were identified by the CDC uh, and applied to K-12 last week. So again, this is all the, trans, the transition to working with this as an endemic disease, a virus and disease, as opposed to something that was a pandemic. We're still on that way. We're still taking it obviously very seriously. And all of this is rooted in the latest scientific research. So as you know, here's another example of the Charter School Connection. So Dr. Ben Miller, who was the former uh, chair of the Prairie Creek School Board, is a parent of students in our school community now as well. His children went to Prairie Creek, but his children are in our schools now. Um, he just happens to be a professional epidemiologist, and he joined our incident command team as, and has helped us make sure that we understand the research and the studies behind things like test to stay and five day quarantine, as opposed to some of the things that we had been doing to this point, again, based on science continuing to evolve. So these are things that are in the works that will be coming uh, out in the next several days. Um, just wanna just be really straightforward that we do not know what the future holds for this. This is something that we long ago stopped trying to predict, but I wanna assure the board and the community that through our diligence and our difficult decisions, we are in as good of a position to be able to weather the Omicron storm as any district around us. Um, our parents are understanding. They want to test if they if they, they want to have access to testing. Our Q testing program, which is just next door here, we've talked about that. That's the rapid molecular test. We will hit a thousand tests sometime this week if we didn't today. We did hit so since November first, we run a thousand molecular based tests in the room next door. And so that's the kind of service that we're trying to provide to our families. The, the latest antigen tests are the next component. So we have the testing, we have the mitigation strategies, we have people who are wanting to work with us. We have as good of a chance to be able to weather this Omicron storm as any district in the state. And so um, it is a challenge. There is no question. We do not exactly know what is ahead of us. We think it's a, what we understand is it's gonna be a three or so week uh, surge. Um, we are as prepared as we can be and we're ready to make the decisions that need to, but we will continue to make sure that we prioritize uninterrupted in-person learning. And then I'm just bringing back to you as well, the, uh, while it's kind of some people, why are you talking about an exit strategy in the middle of the surge, right? Well, we have to see beyond that, right? We continue to say we acknowledge the difficulty of the situation we're in with an optimistic eye toward the future. And so um, as I brought to you in December, that draft set of exit criteria, I think that those pieces, uh, I, I don't have any updates for uh, any additions or changes uh, for you at this point. I didn't uh, necessarily get a ton of that uh, in the last time that we spoke. We talked hypothetically and, and, um, and, and some, there were some questions, but what I put in the packet is the same thing that we had the last time. I'm not asking you to approve it tonight. We'll bring it again at the end of January. Then I will ask you to approve it then probably along with some other updates to the district protocols. So that is the, uh, the COVID report. What I would say is that we are in the thick of it. It is real. It is here. It is impacting what we do. It's impacting instruction. Um, it is impacting all of our operations every single day, uh, but we are doing the best that we can with the resources we have to appropriately respond, and in many cases, as proactively as we possibly can. So that is the COVID report for right now. Um, it is not all that rosy, but we are ready to rise to meet the challenge. Thank you. Is there any comments or questions? Tom, and then Jeff. Um. There's a field trip that's coming up that's in the consent agenda. 
um, I think it's January 14th that they're leaving. Do the students have to test negative before they go on the field trip? Are you talking about the wrestling trip? Yeah. They do not. We do not require that particular testing piece um, for that. It's not something that we require for athletics. And that's, an ex that's a great example, Tom, of, uh, of how we're doing everything we can. We're not trying, mean, unless there's, uh, you know, some kind of outbreak on a team or we're, we're continuing for it as we normally would. The testing is available for students when we do, if there is something that's an out of town trip, we do talk about um, if, if they are staying over, what are the protocols for those kinds of things. Um, so that's an example of we're not requiring testing at this point. Um, but what we have seen is that our athletic teams really have a commitment to trying to make sure that they can keep their season going unabated. So that's the kind of thing that we're transitioning. Uh, the tests are available. We are not requiring them of our athletes. There are some schools in Minnesota that are doing that. We are not requiring at this point, but we have plenty of testing available. Yeah, I was with you Thursday here and you showed us. And uh, one of the things that I was really happy about is, you know, it looks like we have a really good inventory of tests. Yes. And uh, I mean, I heard, even heard it. I know it's the Q test, but is that like CUE? CUE, yes. CUE, yep. And uh, I know that they, they that's the, the, the official test of like the NBA and things. So huh. I'm just I'm just wondering, I mean, with, you know, protocol and somebody looking in, I mean, just to make it real simple, who's who's eligible to come in and, and drive in over here and get a test? And then secondly, you know, just a little bit of, um, you know, for the point of information, you know, what is the difference between the different types of tests? Great questions. Yep. So the Q test, CUE, is the rapid molecular test, which has the same sensitivity as what people refer to as a PCR test. And so that test is available for our, and it's available for people who are symptomatic, right? So you have to be demonstrating symptoms. You have to be a student in the district. You have to be a staff member in the district. Or you could also be the student of a staff member who might live in another community. So if I live in Lakeville and my student couldn't go to school because they needed a negative COVID test, which means I might have to miss work that day, we'll allow you, if you live in a different community, to test your child here. That's just really to help with our workforce piece. So right now, the people who are eligible for those, PC, those PCR level tests, the molecular Q tests, are our staff, our students and the students of our children of our staff who don't live within the community. And again, we're asking people for symptom. This is not, we're not looking at this as, oh, I'm going to grandma's this weekend. I feel fine. And I'd like to make sure I'm negative. That's not what this test is for, right? This is to be able, if someone has symptoms, we have a lot of students who just, a, you know, in early November, kids who are having the kinds of symptoms that were associated with seasonal allergies, they can come and get a test. Then they can come back to school because they know that they don't have uh, COVID-19 uh, in their system. The two uh, antigen tests that we have, those rapid, I, I can't tell you the specific uh, technical or scientific differences between the BD Veritor and the Binax now. What I can tell you is they are both offered to us for free by the state. So all of these tests that we're talking about, we're getting for free from the state. The BD Veritor um, actually has a reader. So it's a nasal swab. It has a small reader, uh, electronic reader that comes with it. And you have to have a smartphone to be able to process the results. So you have to have an iPhone, a Samsung Galaxy, or a Google Pixel. I don't know why that is, just, just the way it is. So that is a limitation because, of course, not everybody has one of those smartphones. But it is a piece of inventory that we can use with people who do have that. The Binax now is another rapid antigen test, but it's a card-based test. So there is no technology involved. What you do is you, again, that both of these tests, the BD Veritor and the Binax now come with some testing solution. You drop the select to the testing solution, in this case, onto the card. You do the swab of your nose, 15 seconds, five big circles on each nostril, only about halfway up. It's not the brain tickler. And then you insert it into the card. You twist it three times. You close the card. You wait 15 minutes, and it processes and tells you whether it's positive or not. So one is a lower tech piece, right? The BD Veritor is a little bit of a higher tech piece. And of course, the Q is a laboratory level um, tests that we're able to provide here. Your final question, protocol call them, do, who, who do they call? Do they call the district office or do they call? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, sent this out to parents many times and it's on our website for the Q test. You have to make an appointment in advance. So you can, uh, you sign up through something called Calendly for the appointment. Uh, and so you, you sign up, then you pull up outside our uh, health aide goes out, completes the sample, comes back in, runs the test, prints it out for you, and gives you a copy of 
your results at the end. And then uh, for the people who would like the BD Veritor, uh, we just have them stop here at the district office and they can pick up a test. Once we start test to stay um, later this week, we will ask the family if we'd like them, to, if they'd like us to send home the kit with their students or they could stop by their individual school to pick it up. Very good. Amy. So all throughout this pandemic, I've been really thinking of our teachers and our staff. And you talked about it a little bit about how we have 12 and a half unfilled teacher absences. But I was wondering if you could tell us more about um, how the teachers are doing, if the teachers are, are catching COVID or if it's their students who are their kids who are catching COVID that are keeping the teachers out of school. If, if the teachers are catching it, are they also vaccinated? And what is the general morale of the staff? Yeah, those are all difficult questions to answer because they'd be generalizations, right? And so with having, um, you know, 600 or so staff on campus every day, uh, well, what I'll characterize it as this. I think we're seeing uh, a lot more students test positive this year than we did last year. And in fact, the next time I come with a report, it's not even close. I mean, last year, there's a building where we had a total of 25 tests or 25 positives the whole year. And that building has over 30 positives right now in the last 14 days, right? So um, my characterization would be last year, we saw probably a more even split between staff and students. And I, I'd have to look at the data to really, so we are seeing more and more students and more and more younger students test positive right now. We are starting to see, uh, we do have staff who are testing positive. We are seeing uh, people who have been vaccinated and boosted also uh, being infected. Of course, their symptoms tend to be less. They uh, tend to be able to recover more quickly. As we know, the vaccine is not intended to, one of the things it's, it's intended to try to help you prevent getting infected, but that we, there's no vaccine that will prevent you from getting infected. Not, nothing, that's not the way it works, right? But what it will do is it will prevent you from being hospitalized or, or in most cases dying. So when you look at the data, that's what it would, would say. So we are seeing more staff who are testing positive. Um, the morale, I think, is, is, I think it's a difficult piece to, to characterize. People are, there's many, many people who are really happy that we're able to stay in person. It is getting tough, right? I think that we keep coming back and, and people are our team players. Most people are doing a great job of saying, yep, I'll pitch in and I'll help out because I know somebody else might need to help me in the future. But is it easy? No, it isn't easy. And it's like the rest of public service right now. Public service is so essential in times of crisis. And our teachers and staff, um, I mentioned 12 and a half teachers being out today. We had 20, 20 unfilled educational assistant absences. Those are people who would typically work one-on-one -on -one with the student or maybe with small groups of students. So public service is tough right now. I don't care what, which, what you're in, if it's, whether it's in education, whether it's in the hospital, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's in EMS services, it is, it is a difficult piece but we take that public service very seriously, right? We chose these careers because it does something for our community more than just for ourselves. To say it would be easy uh, to say, oh yeah, we're fine, that would not be appropriate. Um, but do I think that people understand where we are at? I think that most people do. I think morale is a difficult piece. I think it depends upon the day and the time, right? In terms of how people are feeling. Um, and then how long do we have to sustain it? Uh, we are gonna be coming up on two years. Right? On March 15th of 2020 is when the governor announced everybody was shifting to distance learning. That's what, two months from now, right? So I think that we have also tried to be realistic about when is this thing really going to be over. It will be over someday. We don't know when it will be over. Um, it is tough, but we try to approach this work as the public service that we signed up to do. This No one signed up to do this. Let me tell you that straightforward. But at the same time, we do know that we have this commitment to public service and that we want to support our community. We are proud to support our community. We just ask that our community support us as well. Uh, no one wants to call home and say, say that your kid has to quarantine or go home. No one wants to say they were exposed. And the, we'd all prefer to be talking every time about letters training or debating the finer parts of what should we do at the high school. But this is the hand we've been dealt right now. And so we can either whine about it and complain or we can try to meet it head on. 
We should all be able to whine and complain about it a little bit each day, right? But our staff has done an amazing job of fulfilling their public service at this time. And I think they should, I think we just really need to honor and recognize that. And again, morale depends on the day, it depends on the time, it depends on the week, because things do go in cycles, right? You see as cases increase and you see that you can feel that in the building. You can feel people feel that, right? And then as they recede, you can see some relief. Um, that's not a very articulate answer to your question, Amy, but it's from my heart about what people are doing. And I thank our staff multiple times a week. And every time I mean it from the bottom of my heart, because these folks are doing amazing work in a very difficult circumstance. And so that's my long answer to your reasonable question. Well, thank you. And I think I can say, speaking on behalf of the whole board, that we all thank our staff and our teachers for their dedication and their commitment to get the kids and the school district through this time. School nurses, health aides, everyone has had to be creative and thinking about how do they think do things differently. The building principal, right? The building principal who's making sure that every position is covered and how do we make sure that this happens? Um, so everybody is pitching in and doing everything that they can to make it as good of a system as we can right now for everybody. And this isn't just us, you know, this is everybody in the state um, is dealing with this right now. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? And I wanted to piggyback on those same comments, Amy, about just thanking our, our staff. I know if we passed out 1800 kits, that, that was a lot of interaction with the public. And I'm confident that most of our community members were um, grateful and respectful and all that, but I also know tensions are high. And so I just, appreciate the nurses and the other staff who have been passing out kits and answering questions. I know the nurse at the high school has answered my questions on um, several occasions. So she was very patient with me and I just appreciate them. Yeah, and, and I just wanna reiterate, the vast majority of the public is incredibly mm -hmm. supportive, right? I'm very, I am very proud of how Northfield has handled this. Um, we just need to keep all of that in mind. Yeah. I had a question about the masks. Where are they going to be located? So uh, Director of Buildings and Rounds, Cole Nelson and Dorothy Cohen uh, distributed those to schools today. Um, we did not distribute all of them to the schools quite yet. So there were around a thousand that went to each school. They'll be available on demand. Each building will now let people know how they can. We weren't gonna tell people until we knew that we got them. They actually shipped, we got them in this afternoon, one part of the order. We've got another part coming tomorrow. And we also think the youth masks are coming tomorrow. So they're being distributed to school offices mm -hmm. and then staff and students will be able to secure them upon request. Is the youth version for our primary student? Yeah, the youth version, I, I would say, is probably going to be really for that kind of uh, kindergarten through fourth or fifth grade okay. range, depending on the okay. size of the student. So um, we have a, a number of the masks that the one that I'm wearing here tonight. Uh, and then there's the slightly smaller size as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, to the approval of the consent grouping. And as a reminder, there were some personnel items in the table file that were added. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping for separate consideration? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Moved by Amy, second by Julie. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're moving on to items for individual action. I must think we're missing a page. Okay, there are several resolutions um, in the items for individual action. And so Anita will conduct a roll call vote on those. Okay, we have first off the resolution supporting safe routes to school grant application. And Dr. Hillman will be um, presenting on that. Is that correct? I'll just share a few items. And uh, I'm gonna ask Director Building Rounds, Cole Nelson to come up to the podium just for a minute too, if people have any questions about it. So uh, the partnership with the city of Northfield, they're requesting that we partner with them on a safe routes to school project for 2022. So the city actually makes the application for the grant, but there needs to be a resolution of the partnership between the governing boards for them to be able to move forward. So. There's a couple of projects that includes uh, building a sidewalk on the east side of Maple Street to, from Birch Lane to Me the Methodist Church entrance. That's across from uh, Spring Creek Elementary. Uh, there's also a, a trail on the east side of 246 from the roundabout to a new crossing near the high school um, in 2023. Uh, the, the, it's, the good of that part will be in 2023. Um, 
there is going to be some part, there will be some costs around surveying and some things, but they, this is a grants approach that the city is using. The resolution, we simply need to, we're all we're doing is supporting their grant application. Good. Did I get that close to right? Okay, good. Okay, any questions? Okay, Amy. Hi, Cole. Thanks for patiently waiting till we <laughs> got to you tonight. So my question is on the Maple Street, um, and it's mostly, I think it's great that they're going to add some sidewalk there, but I'm wondering if there's been any consideration to how that might affect where students cross the street, and I'm, I guess I'm worried that students might be trying to cross in the middle of the street and not at an intersection. Could be on here. Um, yes, I have to look at their plans again, but I believe there is a crossing about be about in the center of the Spring Creek property. So there is an actual crosswalk that's designated on there um, for that to happen to get over to Spring Creek. And that's part of, you know, creating this the, the safer routes to school for um, getting to both locations. So they would be connecting the, the crosswalk, same goes with the high school. They added that new cross crosswalk to the north. Um, it's connecting that on the east side of the road as well. So. So it's strictly a crosswalk and it won't be at an intersection. It won't be at an intersection. There's a crosswalk for the one on Maple Street. Um, it would not be at an intersection, nor would the one on 246, but the one on 246 is that main crosswalk that they added, um, I think, fairly recently. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Julie? I had a question. Um, so I'm happy that we're able to approve this tonight so that the city can move forward. Uh, wondering when they submit the application apparently around January 14th, do you know the timing of whether they will hear when it's being awarded and their confidence level as to being awarded this? That I, do, I would have to check for them to see when they would have or when they would find out when the um, grant would be rewarded. And then from there, I would imagine it's pretty, pretty quickly after that, um, as Dr. Hillman had mentioned, it's um, FY 23 and 24 that they would be doing the construction. And they have some funds that they have to put forth um, from their own budget, and it's kind of a match um, grant. So I think they're fairly confident that it will take place. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think they're great projects. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. Okay, so we'll have a roll call vote now. We need a motion first. Oh, I'm sorry. We need a, do we have a motion to approve the supporting safe routes to school grant application? Moved by Jeff, second by Julie. Baraniak? Aye. Butler? Aye. Gerwitz? Aye. Gonzalez George? Aye. Pritchard? Aye. Quinnell? Aye. Stratmon? A resolution passes. Okay, we have policy 491, COVID-19 reporting, testing, and masking. We will be voting on this one tonight. And Dr. Hillman, can I answer any of your questions? Yeah, so the um, we're approving this policy 491 um, to what would comply with the federal OSHA emergency temporary standard, often called ETS, um, that is intended to safeguard the health of employees from the hazard of COVID-19. So this is a federal OSHA regulation. It's an emergency temporary standard that actually goes into effect today. Uh, this is a uh, standard that has been caught up in the Court of Appeals. It was in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, in December, uh, the Court of Appeals lifted its stay, allowing it to be implemented. Uh, I believe it was 27 different states appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court heard this case on Friday. So we are asking you to approve this policy so that we are immediately in compliance with the ETS if the Supreme Court allows it to move forward. So we have to be prepared if the Supreme Court allows it to move forward, if it becomes legally enforceable, if the ETS becomes legally enforceable, this policy then goes into effect. If it is not legally enforceable, the policy is not in effect. In effect. So the policy has got language that is actually contingent upon whether the ETS is legally enforceable. And to be super clear, what the ETS says is that em uh, employees in organizations with 100 or more employees would need to report their vaccination status to the employer. It is not a mandatory vaccination policy. It would simply say that employees must report their vaccination status to the employer. And then if they are not vaccinated, they would need to submit to weekly testing and submit the negative results result to the district. 
um, in school districts where they are not necessarily uh, having a universal face masking requirement like we do. Uh, in that case, those unvaccinated people would, would also need to mask at that point. That's not something that we have in this uh, district here. Uh, but we did work with our school district attorney, Rep. Anderson Squires in Waldsburg to help prepare this. And again, the policy would only go into effect if the uh, ETS is allowed to be legally enforceable. The Supreme Court heard the case on Friday. Uh, we anticipate that they will uh, make a ruling on this at some point in the near future. So normally we would bring this for you for two readings, but what we know we need to do is have this in place so that if it is allowed to move forward, that we have it. The fines are substantial. If you are not in compliance, if this is allowed to go into effect, the, thousands, the fines are $13,000 and change per incident per day. There's 130,000 or, or some dollar maximum number of or amount of fines. But it is if it is allowed to go into effect, we have to be prepared to comply with it. So again, it's a policy that's contingent on it being legally enforceable. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, Tom. Uh, yeah, just a little clarification in part eight. Um, uh, B, it, ta it lists three points that, and it says um, employees may return to work after all the following are true. But in part A, uh, point two, it, uh, it, it lists three things, but it, it, it doesn't specifically say the employees um, have to meet all of those. It doesn't say they only have to meet one, but it doesn't say they have to meet them all. And, and um, I don't know if we need, if that needs to be specifically stated that all three of those criteria have to be met. So just to be clear, you're talking about 8B. Eight 8A. Eight, 8A. Eight eight uh, 2. 2. It says the school district will immediately remove the workplace, any employee. Um, and then there are three criteria. Um, it doesn't say, um, specifically that they have to meet all of those three. I mean, the wording makes it sound like that, but it doesn't state it specifically. And I wonder if it should, so there's no ambigu ambiguity. Uh, Tom, we could check on that. Um, what I will, my understanding of the technical details of things like that is that these are coming directly from the OSHA regulations. Oh. And we've been advised to be careful about modifying them. Okay. Because in that case, I would say A and B or, right, there's that third one. So right. um, I, I, my recommendation would be to leave it as is okay. for right now. Julie? Um, the other point that, that you may respond as well about leaving as is, is the 10 on uh, that same uh, eight uh, heading B where it talks about 10 days. Of quarantine that could be adjusted based on CDC's new guidelines of five. Yes. Yeah, so if you and then if you look at the bottom, so Julie, if you take a look at the bottom part, if the CDC's isolation guidance changes following the adoption of the policy, the school district will update its isolation guidance and communicate that effect to affected employees. Okay. And that will at least meet the minimum CDC requirements. So that's the okay. flexibility if the CDC when the C if that the, as that changes. So, and what I understand is Minnesota is under the OSHA guidelines. There are about 27 states are within that. So not every state public schools are necessarily having that is correct. To, it's only those 27 states correct. of which one is Minnesota. And then based on the uh, the um, sort of recap of the Supreme Court hearing on Friday, it does not appear that this one, but we don't know but it seems more unlikely than likely that they will pass this mandate. We will find out. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. <clears throat> okay, do we have, uh, yeah, do we have a motion to approve policy 491? Moved by Amy, second by right, Tom. Okay, all those in favor say aye. I Aye. Opposed. Okay. Policy 491 passes. Next is the revised long-term facilities maintenance plan and Director of Finance Val Murdersdorf will present and she and Director of Buildings and Grounds Cole Nelson can answer any board members questions on this and the following item, the middle school roof or some of you know it as the middle school rough. <laughs> it, 
Is there, um, I'll take a motion to approve the revised LTFM plan. Is there a motion moved by Amy, second by Julie, and then we'll go ahead and have a presentation and discussion. Absolutely. So um, as part of the um, bonding for the middle school roof, since we are doing that as long-term facility maintenance bonds, we are required to revise the 10-year plan, have the board approve it, and submit it to MDE for approval. So um, on the documents in your packet, I highlighted in purple any numbers that I changed. Um, and I'm just going to talk through those really briefly. Um, I didn't change anything outside of what we're doing with the roof. Um, we're actually going to be bringing the capital and LTFM budgets to you probably at the next meeting or the first one in February. So you're going to see this again shortly, but this is just strictly related to the roof and the requirements for the department. Um, so the first one um, you have is the actual expenditures. And so you'll see on the line for roof systems, um, we are actually starting the project or they have the availability to start the project April 15th, once we award the bid. Um, so there will be some expenditures incurred this fiscal year um, and then some expenditures in the next fiscal year. So that's why there's two line items there. We estimated how much could um, fall in either year. Um, for actual expenditures and revenue, it, it won't matter. We'll get fully reimbursed for it, but that's why it looks that way on the chart. And then there's uh, 69,000 um, right in the section below that. Because of the timing of our levy, we do actually have to transfer LTFM funds um, into our debt service to cover the first two interest payments um, until we get through our next levy cycle and get the new bond on the levy document, and then that'll um, fix that. So that's what that 69,000 is. And then the very last section on that page, um, because this project is over $2 million, we are required to book everything in fund six, which is our building construction fund. Um, We've used that all for um, the five projects we did, and now that's been zeroed out, and now this project will also flow through there. And so that's just showing that the bond proceeds will get deposited in there and spent on the project. And then the, the next document, um, I apologize for how chaotic it is to look at. Um, this is the official form we are required to submit to the Department of Ed. Um, the only changes on here are on the second page of it, um, line 50B in purple. This is the amount uh, um, of revenue that we will, um, basically they reduce the, our levy. So instead of um, getting the money and paying it towards debt service, they just reduce the revenue we get um, to simplify that process. And so it's about um, 70, um, 76,000 for the first few years. And then once our previous bond, um, falls off in 2027, um, then it'll jump up to about 260,000. So it is a 20 year bond. Um, it ends up being about 17% of our total LTFM revenue. Um, but very, um, we feel very comfortable that we'll be able to manage um, that payment as well as the other projects with the funds that will be remaining. So this is really just a, a technicality um, to revise this um, to show MBE what um, we are doing with the bonds. Any specific questions about that? It's a lot to look at, but I didn't change very much. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you for presenting. Yeah. Okay, this is a roll call vote, and we do have a motion and a second. So we'll let Anita facilitate that roll call vote. Braniak? Aye. Butler? Aye. Turwitz? Uh, aye. Gonzalez George? Aye. Pritchard? Aye. Cunell? Aye. Stratmon? Aye. Okay, the revised long term facilities maintenance plan passes. 
Our final item on um, the individual action is approval is the approval bid for the middle school roof. Is there a motion to approve the bid for the middle school roof? Okay, moved by Tom, second by Amy. Are there any questions on the middle school roof? Any discussion, comments, Jeff? Um, so really, I don't think we're getting the expected life that we really wanted out of the middle school roof, but it, we also just absolutely got hammered on that hailstorm, right? So, I mean, we must have done some patchwork back then. So, you know, on the perspective of what, you know, should and what's actually happening, how long did you expect to get out of that roof? And you're not doing that. It's so, I mean, we're having to do this a little bit early. Yeah, so I did check. Uh, there was one of the questions at the last meeting when we asked, um, you know, we were going out for the referendum on the warranty. So I did check into that. And the original warranty uh, was a 15 year warranty. Um, as we said before, it was, it's a ballasted EPDM roof on that roof. Um, so per that, you know, we did get the life expectancy. Obviously things have came a long ways since then as far as technology and roofs and, and this new roof um, kind of and how we you know, set this up with the debt service um, is this is a 30 year warranty on this roof, which yeah. is similar to the um, Greenville Park mm -hmm. um, that was put on along with Bridgewater. Um, and it's kind of been a standard that way. So again, trying to get that additional life out of them. Uh, it's obviously a critical part of the building. Um, it was very necessary to keep that building enclosure, you know, watertight. So that's answer your question. Yes. Perfect. Julie. I'm sorry, I appreciate how much we've learned about getting in front of the bids and getting the work um, awarded. So I'm happy that it's before us tonight so we can take advantage of that. I'm just wondering about the bid process. Did we receive an expected number of bids that you felt you, we would receive or based on market where um, construction and, and the roof industry is in terms of how, how they are taking on or looking at these types of projects? Yeah, so it's a definite um, interesting bidding, you know, process and everything. We did receive four bids on bid day, which is always good. Um, that's always getting competitive quotes. So we know that there was interest in the project. Um, and that was about similar to what we had at our pre-bid meeting. Um, the bids were kind of very sporadic um, as far as, you know, we had our highest bid was 3.8 million. Um, and then obviously the low bid here um, with 3 million, 294, 800. So, um, I think there, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty in the market. We were strategic in how we designed the project to try to alleviate some of the, you know, building materials that are shortages of and, and try to get creative in that sense. So I think overall we're doing very well. That was, you know, very close to our budget um, that we had proposed to it. So we feel confident in that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Did you say or someone say that the construction starts April 15th? Yeah, so when we um, did the bids, we asked for a alternate schedule um, for a potential deduct um, to afford some of the work during school. Um, none of the contractors bid on that um, just due to the you know size of that middle school roof. Um, so our plan through the school year, which would be April 15th as a tentative start date based on the materials that they need to start the project, um, they would be working a alternative schedule. So they would not actually be performing any of the um, smell or work after or before 3 p.m. So everything um, that would impact today, they would be starting from 3 p.m. Um, it's something a little bit new that they've been working with other districts, but um, it's important to make sure that the learning can happen during the day and then we can do the work um, in the evening. So that's kind of how we're, we're scheduling that. Great, thanks. That's a great idea. I Yes, Julie. I just had one more comment. Um, so Cole, you, you don't have the opportunity to be before the board that often. So just want to, of course, thank you for all the work that you are doing, particularly on, um, you know, getting the uh, uh, all the needed materials that we need for tests to stay and masks and everything else. And I know that I sort of feel like between yourself and Dorothy and Anita, you are the tenacious trio. And <laughs> if there is someone on the other end, they better be giving you some information because if not, you will keep after them. So we appreciate in a market where we know supply is, is tough. Thank you, thank you. We know it's, you know, yeah, we're shipping it. And then you probably call back for shipping information and it, well, it didn't ship even though they told you the day before it was. So anyway, so thank you for, for hanging in there and getting all of the, the supplies because it, it, particularly test to say it's, going to be a game changer. So thank you.
Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Good comments. Any other questions or comments? Oh, sure. sure. I never know what this is on. There we go. <laughs> There's no light on this one. Um, one thing I did not mention um, that I meant to, so you'll see that the, the base bid is um, just shy of 3.3 million. Um, this is a little concerning to me and kind of um, hopefully not what we see moving forward, but what I'm anticipating and planning for. So we met with Garland like two months ago, maybe. Yep. And the estimate was 2.8 million um and that was like quotes that they had collected from just kind of rough estimate quotes and probably four to six months prior to that it was like 2.3 to 2.5 estimated so the level of inflation and staffing and materials um those are going to be real impacts to the district um that we're um, obviously watching and keeping an eye on the bond uh, is actually for 3.12 million with actual project funds, I think of just shy of 3.1, um, if I'm remembering correctly, which you'll, um, that'll be at your next board meeting that you'll get to see those totals. But we are, we do have enough LTFM fund balance to cover that differential. Um, it was not something we felt we needed to redo the bid process on for the bonds um because we had enough to cover that but i just wanted to point that out that it is actually more than what we're bonding for um based on the the rate of inflation and um, construction costs that we've seen thank you any other questions or comments thank you so much okay so we yeah, um, we do have a motion, and so we're going to take a roll call vote now. Braniak? Aye. Butler? Aye. Berwitz? Aye. Gonzalez George? Aye. Pritchard? Aye. Quinnell? Aye. Stratmon? Aye. Okay, motion passes, or resolution passes. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, we're on to our items for information and Dr. Hillman will present the enrollment report to us. Yep, so you'll see the enrollment report ending uh, January 3rd. Uh, and if you look at that final line, the full-time excluding early childhood and part-time independent study, uh, we were down uh, just about eight, seven students uh, between the December and this one. Uh, again, we do see some of that fluctuation during the year. If you look at that bottom line, we have gone up and down a little bit throughout the year. And so 3,809 total here for the January 3rd enrollment report. And if you take a look at the corresponding buildings, um, if you really focus on like the K-12 buildings, you'll see Greenville Park stayed right about the same. Spring Creek had a few additional students. Bridgewater went down just a few students. The middle school, roughly the same. Uh, the high school down just a few students. So that is uh, how you end up getting to that uh, slight decline uh, between December and January. Thank you. Amy? Did the ALC have students who ended their program? Yes, that's when you'll see that 121 to 82, that often is those students who are not full time. Question. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hillman. Okay, that is all of our business for tonight. Our next meetings will be Mondays, January 24th, February 14th, and February 28th at 6 p.m. in the district boardroom. With that, I ask for a motion to adjourn. All right, moved by Noel, seconded by Jeff. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.